Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number three. Maxwell's Equations Part 2, the Faraday Fallacy. This is intended for um, people who have already are familiar with Maxwell's Equations. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with Maxwell's Equations, I recommend to go right to video number four. So from the previous video, we learned that the displacement current cannot contribute to a magnetic field. I'm sorry for the the mess on my, my laser printer is screwing up. Um, I'm going to get that looked at. Um, the displacement current cannot contribute to a magnetic field, otherwise a dipole antenna would not operate. That's what we learned in the last video. Let's continue on. Uh, we're going to continue with this equation now. This is Faraday's, I'm sorry, this is Maxwell's version of Faraday's law. And this says that the cur an electric curl about a uh, time-changing magnetic field, uh, I'm sorry, a time-changing magnetic field creates an electric curl. Now what you'll never find in any textbook on electromagnetic physics is Faraday's law, Maxwell's version of Faraday's law, printed on the same page as Kirchhoff's law. And Kirchhoff's law in integral form is this, in point form is this. Now the typical excuse you will hear among folks is that, well, uh, this is only for uh, Time, uh, this Kirchhoff law is only for non-time varying field. It's the static condition. That's one excuse you'll hear. The other excuse you'll hear is, is that, well, this is a non-conservative electric field. Well, okay. This is getting to be nonsense now because the whole purpose of an electric field is to be conservative. This is not a conservative field. It's not an electric field. And we'll, we'll cover that aspect. But let's go the Kirchhoff law aspect first. Now, any electrical engineering student will be told that you can apply Kirchhoff's law to AC circuits. Okay, well, let's do that. Let's do what an undergraduate engineering student can do. Let's take our circuit, the very circuit that Maxwell defined to use to define the, the plane wave equation, or to de derive the displacement current. Now, let's pick two points here, and we know that the uh, voltage on a capacitor is 1 over the integral, integral from 0 to t, the current in the loop as a function of t dt and that's the voltage in the the voltage in the inductor called inductance l is l d i d t and then kirchhoff's law says if we add those together they should come up to 0 so 1 over c the integral is 0 to t i dt plus l d i dt equals zero, Kirchhoff's law. Now with the magic of television, I've already gone through and done all that so you don't have to go through the pain of doing this. And so what do we come up with? What we come up with is we find out that the, the magnetic field in the inductor and the electric field in the capacitor are 45 degrees out of phase. And the energy that you'll find in the complete magnetic field when the magnetic field is peak will equal the energy in the electric field in the total electric field in the capacitor but they'll occur at different times. They'll be 45 degrees out of phase. So they're in quadrature. And because the energy in the tank circuit is constant over time, we're not covering losses here. Losses will be discussed uh, in a future video. We're going to assume this is, you know, so substantially losses over the period of time that we are uh, discussing it. And therefore, the work is going to be equal to, is going to be, the energy is going to be constant over time. So, here's something we're going to do. We're going to plot on the, in, in what we call a real and imaginary space. That's an engineering thing. In the real space, we're going to plot the B. In the imaginary space, we're going to plot the E. And you can kind of see, if you're looking from the side, this kind of looks like a corkscrew. And this looking down the top looks like a corkscrew. And so if you plot these in that way, you get a helix. And that is what we call the, that's a complex uh, operator. It fits into a complex operator. And we can just, so we can map this entire system into a complex operator, which is great. There's so many beautiful things you can do with this complex operator. Okay, now, now the cool thing is, the reason why I have the word radiator up here, because if you go look, at the radar handbook, and I hope you can see that from up there. The array theory 
their radiation patterns are little e to the j omega. I hope that's not blurry. I should have got a big print of that. So, the and this is the same for the wireless communication book. They're also using the complex operator to represent electromagnetic rays in free space. Okay, which means they have a in phase. That's what in phase and quadrature component. And all processing you do for radio is dealt with with an in phase and a quadrature component. And it all works beautifully with this system. So you say to yourself, well, wait a minute. If if the radar and the wireless communication people are using this e to the j omega, but it's the same derivation as an LC tank circuit, how, how can that be? Well, remember how Maxwell came up with the plane wave equation. He took an LC circuit up, and then what we did is we fashioned it into a dipole. Okay, this is still an LC circuit. Okay, the current goes through the center, and that gives us our magnetic field, and the displacement current comes back. I'm going to show the displacement current out to the side only so you can see it, but it really comes back through the center. So the displacement current is necessary for us to actually move the charge through this open circuit. That actually completes the circuit. So the displacement current allows us to have a dipole that operates, but it cannot contribute to a magnetic field because it would cancel the magnetic field created by the real current. And this thing wouldn't radiate. But there's another reason why the displacement current can't also create a magnetic field. It's because then this dipole would not have any magnetic field and therefore it could not have inductance L. So the displacement current is wrong for two reasons. In the previous video we showed that the dipole wouldn't radiate. In this I'm going to show you that the LC circuit couldn't have inductance if there's no magnetic field. And so there's, that's another reason why the displacement current is wrong. Because this circuit, in order to be, it needs the magnetic field to both to be both re radiant and reactive. So, or resonant, I guess would be the other word. So, what does Maxwell's plane wave look like? And we're going to discuss Maxwell's plane wave, plane wave in more detail later. But Maxwell has two in phase components. If you plot them in real and imaginary space, you basically just get one big cosine wave, which is stuck halfway between real and imaginary space, so it's kind of like in the twilight zone. And the other worst part of it is you get power that's not uniform over time. Now again, we're going to go into this in more detail in the next video where we actually compare all the plane waves. So let's go on. What's really going on with Maxwell's uh, derivation of, of Faraday's law. The problem is, is it's de derived from Faraday's law. And Faraday's law does not put voltage here. This is E is a derivative of voltage, but EMF is not voltage. Okay, EMF is, kin is kinetic energy per charge. It's not potential energy for charge, which this is the der derivative of. Okay, and in Faraday's law, we get, you get the EMF from the time rate of change of the flux contained by the closed loop. And, that, and the, the reason why you can have a volt, the, an EMF in a closed loop is because it's not a conservative field like the other argument was. Okay, but it's not an electric field. It's a kinetic energy per charge uh, manifestation. So let's show you another detail of what's going on. What happens is, just, is you have a changing magnetic field in the, in the inductor. That imparts kinetic energy to charges. In the form of one half li, in the, in, the, in the amount of one half li squared, that kinetic energy charge then f uh, pulls uh, mobile electrons around one side, and they bunch up at one side of the capacitor, opposing their uh, free, uh, freed up charges on the other side. And now the kinetic, the potential energy in the plate is now one half cv squared, the voltage across the plates. Okay, but there's a there's an important problem, important difference here. Okay, the difference is is that the time the kinetic energy is imparted and the time it takes for the charges to build up and cause the voltage, there's a time delay. Okay, that time delay, if you put that back into this problem here, would put uh, the E that they have here out of phase by 90 degrees with the B and it would solve the problem with Maxwell's plane wave. But all you're going to end up with is the LC circuit that we have before. So this whole Maxwell stuff is just a fancy, deriv uh, incorrect derivation for an LC oscillator. And you know, you know, there's another example of this. If I take the kinetic energy if, in this cannonball, and if I fire this cannonball up into space in an empty, in an airless space, at the bottom, 
the cannonball is going to have a kinetic energy of one half mv squared. When it reaches the height, it's going to have a potential energy, its maximum height, of mgh. Okay, but the key, the absolute key for all of this energy conversion stuff is that you cannot convert kinetic energy to potential energy or vice versa without a medium. You need a medium. You cannot convert gravity to kinetic energy without a cannonball or like medium. Forgive my cat here. He's decided to come in and visit on this uh, discussion here. Uh, the other point is kinetic energy is the only way to separate charge to create an electric field of potential. Okay, there's, there's not another way to do that. I mean, people say, well, if I had a big charge over here and I put it next to the loop, I can, inf I can use the, the electric field of that big hunk of charges to move those charges to the other side of the loop. Yeah, but where did you get those charges? Ultimately, you need a kinetic field or a kinetic force to draw charges away from their Coulomb uh, trap that they're normally stuck in. Okay, and in all this process, Kirchhoff's law is not violated. Kirchhoff's law is in force because the kinetic energy transfer of to the loop does not violate the electric field in the loop, and therefore Kirchhoff's law is valid under all conditions. And in fact, without Kirchhoff's law, we use Kirchhoff's law to get the valid model used for radiation in wireless communication and in the radar field. Now we could fix this whole nonsense by simply saying, well, gee, you know, we have this E, but it's not really an electric field. So we can drop down here and come up with equivalent V and then go over to E, EMF, and then come up with a fake variable to drop in there, which would, you know, give us an equivalent. But there's a problem here. Come on, get out of here. Sorry, we got visitors here. Terrence and Philip decided that they want to be part of this filming too. Um, <clears throat> but we have a problem. Okay, the problem is, is that Faraday's e, uh, law says that the EMF contained in the loop uh, can only be derived from the, the amount of number of flux lines that change per given time. Unfortunately, with a dipole, a straight wire, it's ambiguous because you don't know, you cannot use this equation to compute the inductance for a dipole because a dipole is an open circuit. Therefore, Faraday's law is undefined for dipoles. It does not allow you to compute the inductance of a dipole. And an inductor has to have a, 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 an inductance, I'm sorry, and a dipole has to have an inductance, otherwise it would not resonate. And if, it, if a dipole did not resonate, uh, there's no sense even tuning it. You know, like uh, ham radio operators like to cut the dipole to the right length to get the right resonance, they get the maximum transfer of energy into space. Uh, so this anomaly where Faraday's law does not apply to linear inductors is a, another uh, definition of pain, a paradox anomaly, an inconsistency and nonsense that we're going to go into in a later video to solve to um, uh, expand our understanding of nature. Uh, and we're going we're to show you that. We're going to have future videos. We're going to show the solution to the in induction dilemma. And we're going to have simple experiments that can be demonstrated in a high school uh, shop class or science fairs, and if we have enough uh, warrant a uh, demand, uh, we'll even make kits. Uh, if you can't wait, uh, w oh, I got sorry, I can't spell in my old age. You can see my graduate thesis at uh, www.stinty.com docs any thesis pdf. Uh, the full Monty is in there. So where are we sit now? Well, because of my exploration, so we've well, let me back up. So the green shows that these models are good. We haven't found anything wrong with these ones yet. This is Gauss's law and this is Kirchhoff's law. And anything to do with the magnetic field is blue, which means it's like, okay, you can use it, just got to be careful because I'm going to show that the B and the H field are not a complete represent representation of magnetic field phenomena. The displacement current's gone and the original version of, of Maxwell's version of Faraday's law is gone. I really don't recommend you use this when we get to the New electromagnetism. I'm going to show you a much more satisfying way to deal with this. And of course, uh, by getting rid of either of these, we get rid of Maxwell's plane wave, which does not define a medium. Although people say those are a medium, we get the wrong wave model with this anyway. So, uh, uh, Maxwell, yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to go ahead and move your desk down to the 
storage area. Yeah. Please donate.